Chapter 16 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 16 Matthew Tyndall. It is easy to mark the progress of the age by recurring to the history of past freethinkers. Bishops, established and dissenting, are now repeating the parts the old deist played. They were sadly treated for setting the example modern divines follow with applause. Matthew Tyndall was an example of this. He labored to establish religion on the foundation of reason and nature. It was to be expected that Christians would be pleased at efforts which would have no effect but to strengthen its foundations. The effort was met by reprobation, and resented as an injury. It is but a just retaliation that believers should now have to establish in vain that evidence they once denounced. Matthew Tyndall was an English deistical writer, who was born at Beer Terrace in Devonshire, 1656. His father, it appears, was a clergyman, who held the living of Beer Terrace presented to him by the University of Cambridge in the time of the Civil Wars. Young Matthew was educated at Oxford, where at twenty-eight he took the degree of L.L.D., Doctor of Laws. Matthew Tyndall, L.L.D., was early tossed about by the winds of doctrine. First he embraced Romanism, afterwards he became a Protestant. Then politics interested him, and he engaged in controversy on the side of William III. He was appointed commissioner of a court for trying foreigners. In 1693 he published an essay on the law of nations. When fifty-four, in 1710, he entered so vigorously into theological controversy, arising out of Trinitarian criticism, that his marked satire led to his books being condemned by the House of Commons, and burnt by the hangman. He resented this indignity by a spirited attack on the dominant priestly party in his High Church Catechism, and he also wrote in defense of philosophical necessity. But his most notable work was the performance of his old age, his Christianity as Old as the Creation, or the Gospel, a republication of the religion of nature. This was produced in his seventy-third year. He was attacked in reply by Bishop Waterland. It is generally agreed that in point of good spirit and good temper the bishop was far inferior to the deist. Dr. Conyers Middleton says Thomas Cooper, in his brief sketch of Tyndall, appeared in defense of Tyndall in a letter to Dr. Waterland, whom he condemned for the shallowness of his answer to Tyndall, and boldly and frankly admitted that the freethinker was right in asserting that the Jews borrowed some of their ceremonies and customs from Egypt that allegory was in some cases employed in the scriptures where common readers took the relation for fact, and that the scriptures are not of absolute and universal inspiration. The following sentence, which will be found in this letter of Dr. Conyers Middleton, does honor to his name. If religion consists in depreciating moral duties and depressing natural reason, if the duty of it be to hate and persecute for a different way of thinking where the best and wisest have never agreed, then I declare myself an infidel, and to have no share in that religion. Matthew Tyndall died at his house in Coldbath Fields of the Stone, 1773, aged 77. Riersbach, the famous statuary, took a model of him. Note, Julian Hibbert gives 1656 to 7, Dr. Beard, 1656, Thomas Cooper, 1657, as the year of Tyndall's birth. All agree that he died 1733. He was therefore 76 or 77 at the time of his death. Tyndall opens his great work thus. The author makes no apology for writing on a subject of the last importance, and which, as far as I can find, has nowhere been so fully treated. He builds nothing on a thing so uncertain as tradition. 
which differs in most countries and of which in all countries the bulk of mankind are incapable of judging but thinks he has laid down such plain and evident rules as may enable men of the meanest capacity to distinguish between religion and superstition and has represented the former in every part so beautiful so amiable and so strongly affecting that they who in the least reflect must be highly in love with it and easily perceive that their duty and happiness are inseparable the character of the performance will be seen from a few of the propositions he maintains that god at all times has given mankind sufficient means of knowing whatever he requires of them that the religion of nature consists in observing those things which our reason by considering the nature of god and man and the relation we stand in to him and one another demonstrates to be our duty and that those things are plain and likewise what they are that the perfection and happiness of all rational beings supreme as well as subordinate consist in living up to the dictates of their nature that god requires nothing for his own sake no not the worship we are to render him nor the faith we are to have in him that the not adhering to those notions reason dictates concerning the nature of god has been the occasion of all superstition and those innumerable mischiefs that mankind on the account of religion have done either to themselves or one another the bulk of mankind by their reason must be able to distinguish between religion and superstition otherwise they can never extricate themselves from that superstition they chance to be educated in tyndall deals with the question of the obscurity of revelation in these terms sufficiently salient to alarm the very proper divines of that day had god from time to time spoken to all mankind in their several languages and his words had miraculously conveyed the same ideas to all persons yet he could not speak more plainly than he has done by the things themselves and the relation which reason shows there is between them nay since it is impossible in any book or books that a particular rule could be given for every case we must even then have had recourse to the light of nature to teach us our duty in most cases especially considering the numberless circumstances which attend us and which perpetually varying may make the same actions according as men are differently affected by them either good or bad and i may add that most of the particular rules laid down in the gospel for our direction are spoken after such figurative a manner that except we judge of their meaning not merely by the letter but by what the law of nature antecedently declares to be our duty they are apt to lead us wrong and if precepts relating to morality are delivered after an obscure manner when they might have been delivered otherwise what reason can you assign for its being so but that infinite wisdom meant to refer us to that law for the explaining of them sufficient instances of this nature i shall give you hereafter though i must own i cannot carry this point so far as a learned divine who represents the scriptures more obscure which one would think impossible than even the fathers he tells us that a certain author viz flaccus illyricus has furnished us with one and fifty reasons for the obscurity of the scriptures adding i think i may truly say that the writing of the prophets and apostles abound with tropes and metaphors types and allegories parables and dark speeches and are as much nay much more unintelligible in many places than the writings of the ancients it is well this author who talks of people being stark bible mad stopped here and did not with a celebrated wit cry the truly illuminated books are the darkest of all 
the writer above mentioned suppose it impossible that god's will should be fully revealed by books except says he it might be said perhaps without a figure that even the world itself could not contain the books which should be written but with submission to this reverend person i cannot help thinking but that such is the divine goodness god's will is so clearly and fully manifested in the book of nature that he who runs may read it dean swift tale of a tub in the next extract we make we find tyndall quoting two striking passages from lord shaftesbury followed by an acute vindication of the integrity of the law of nature over the scriptures had the heathen distinguished themselves by creeds made out of spite to one another and mutually persecuted each other about the worship of their gods they would soon have made the number of their votaries as few as the gods they worshipped but we don't find except in egypt that motherland of superstition that they ever quarrelled about their gods though their gods sometimes quarrelled and fought about their votaries by the universal liberty that was allowed by the ancients matters as a noble author observes were so balanced that reason had fair play learning and science flourished wonderful was the harmony and temper which arose from these contrarieties thus superstition and enthusiasm were mildly treated and being let alone they never raged to that degree as to occasion bloodshed wars persecutions and devastations but a new sort of policy has made us leap the bounds of natural humanity and out of a supernatural charity has taught us the way of plaguing one another most devoutly it has raised an antipathy that no temporal interest could ever do and entailed on us a mutual hatred to all eternity and savage zeal with meek and pious semblance works dreadful massacre and for heaven's sake horrid pretence makes desolate the earth and further shaftesbury observes the jupiter of strangers was among the ancients one of the solemn characters of divinity the peculiar attribute of the supreme deity benign to mankind and recommending universal love mutual kindness and benignity between the remotest and most unlike of the human race such was the ancient heathen charity and pious duty towards the whole of mankind both those of different nations and different worship but good god how different a character do bigots give us of the deity making him an unjust cruel and inconsistent being requiring all men to judge for themselves and act according to their consciences and yet authorizing some among them to judge for others and to punish them for not acting according to the consciences of those judges though ever so much against their own these bigots thought they were authorized to punish all those that differ with them in their religious worship as god's enemies but had they considered that god alone could discern men's hearts and alone discover whether any by conscientiously offering him a wrong worship could become his enemies and that infinite wisdom best knew how to proportion the punishment to the fault as well as infinite power how to inflict it they would surely have left it to god to judge for himself in a cause which immediately related to himself and where they were not so much as parties concerned and as likely to be mistaken as those they would punish can one without horror think of men's breaking through all the rules of doing as they would be done unto in order to set themselves up for standards of truth for god as well as man do not these impious wretches suppose that god is not able to judge for himself at least not able to execute his own judgment 
and that therefore he has recourse forsooth to their superior knowledge or power and they are to revenge his injuries root out his enemies and restore his lost honour though with the destruction of the better part of mankind but to do the propagators of these blasphemous notions justice they do not throw this load of scandal on the law of nature or so much as pretend from thence to authorize their execrable principles but endeavor to support them by traditional religion especially by misinterpreted texts from the old testament and thereby make not only natural and revealed religion but the old and new testament the latter of which requires doing good both to jews and gentiles contradict each other but to return if what the light of nature teaches us concerning the divine perfections when duly attended to is not only sufficient to hinder us from falling into superstition of any kind whatever but as i have already shown demonstrates what god from his infinite wisdom and goodness can or cannot command how is it possible that the law of nature and grace can differ how can it be conceived that god's laws whether internally or externally revealed are not at all times the same when the author of them is and has been immutably the same forever the following passage exhibits the judicious mixture of authority and argument for which our author is remarkable the quotation is a good illustration of tyndall's best manner he is replying to dr samuel clark it cannot be imputed to any defect in the light of nature that the pagan world ran into idolatry but to their being entirely governed by priests who pretended communication with their gods and to have thence their revelations which they imposed on the credulous as divine oracles whereas the business of the christian dispensation was to destroy all those traditional revelations and restore free from all idolatry the true primitive and natural religion implanted in mankind from the creation the doctor clark however seems afraid lest he had allowed too much to the light of nature in relation to the discovery of our duty both to god and man and not left room for revelation to make any addition he therefore supposes there are some duties which nature hints at only in general but if we cannot without highly reflecting on the wisdom and goodness of god suppose that he has not at all times given the whole rational creation a plain rule for their conduct in relation to those duties they owe to god themselves and one another must we not suppose reason and religion that rule of all other rules inseparable so that no rational creature can be ignorant of it who attends to the dictates of his own mind i mean as far as it is necessary for him to know it an ignorant peasant may know what is sufficient for him without knowing as much as the learned rector of st james's though the doctor says the knowledge of the law of nature is in fact by no means universal yet he asserts that man is plainly in his own nature an accountable creature which supposes that the light of nature plainly and undeniably teaches him that law for breach of which he is naturally accountable and did not the doctor believe this law to be universal he could not infer a future judgment from the conscience all men have of their actions or the judgment they pass on them in their own minds whereby they that have not any law are a law unto themselves their consciences bearing witness and their thoughts accusing or excusing one another which is supposing but one law whether that law be written on paper or in men's hearts only and that all men by the judgment they pass on their own actions are conscious of this law 
and the apostle paul though quoted by the doctor is so far from favoring his hypothesis of any invincible ignorance even in the wisest and best of the philosophers that he by saying the gentiles that have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law makes the law of nature and grace to be the same and supposes the reason why they were to be punished was their sinning against light and knowledge that which may be known of god was manifest in them and when they knew god they glorified him not as god and they were likewise guilty of abominable corruptions not ignorantly but knowing the judgment of god that they who do such things are worthy of death had the doctor but considered this self-evident proposition that there can be no transgression where there is no law and that an unknown law is the same as no law and consequently that all mankind at all times must be capable of knowing all whether more or less that god requires it would have prevented his endeavouring to prove that till the gospel dispensation mankind were entirely and unavoidably ignorant of their duty in several important points and thus charging the light of nature with undeniable defects i think it no compliment to external revelation though the doctor designed it as the highest to say it prevailed when the light of nature was as he supposes in a manner extinct since then an irrational religion might as easily obtain as a rational one the doctor to prove that revelation has supplied the insufficiency and undeniable defects of the light of nature refers us to philippians four one which he introduces after this pompous manner let any man of an honest and sincere mind consider whether that practical doctrine has not even in itself the greatest marks of a divine original wherein whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there be any virtue if there be anything praiseworthy all these and these only are earnestly recommended to man's practice i would ask the doctor how he can know what these are which are thus alone earnestly recommended to man's practice or why they have in themselves the greatest marks of a divine original but from the light of nature nay how can the doctor know there are defects in the light of nature but from that light itself which supposes this light is all we have to trust to and consequently all the doctor has been doing on pretence of promoting the honor of revelation is introducing universal scepticism and i am concerned and grieved to see a man who had so great a share of the light of nature employing it to expose that light of which before he had given the highest commendation and which can have no other effect than to weaken even his own demonstration drawn from that light for the being of a god i shall mention but one text more which had not the doctor thought it highly to his purpose for showing the insufficiency of the light of nature he would not have ushered it in after this most solemn manner when men have put themselves into this temper and frame of mind let them try if they can any longer reject the evidence of the gospel if any man will do his will he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of god is it not strange to see so judicious a divine right after such a manner as if he thought the best way to support the dignity of revelation was to derogate from the immutable and eternal law of nature and while he is depressing it extol revelation for those very things it borrows from that law in which though he asserts there are undeniable defects yet he owns that god governs all his own actions by it and expects that all men should so govern theirs but i find the doctor's own brother the dean of sarum 
is entirely of my mind as to those texts the doctor quotes viz romans two fourteen and philippians four eight as to the first viz romans two fourteen he says the apostle supposes that the moral law is founded in the nature and reason of things that every man is endued with such powers and faculties of mind as render him capable of seeing and taking notice of this law and also with such a sense and judgment of the reasonableness and fitness of conforming his actions to it that he cannot but in his own mind acquit himself when he does so and condemn himself when he does otherwise and as to the second viz philippians four eight where the same apostle recommends the practice of virtue upon the forementioned principles of comeliness and reputation these principles says he if duly attended to were sufficient to instruct men in the whole of their duty towards themselves and towards each other and they would also have taught them their duty towards god their creator and governor if they had diligently pursued them for according as the apostle expresses it romans one twenty the invisible things of god from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead the same fitness and decency that appears in men's regular behavior towards each other appears also in their behavior towards god and this likewise is founded in the nature and reason of things and is what the circumstances and condition they are in do absolutely require thus we see therein moral virtue or good consists and what the obligation to it is from its own native beauty and excellency one more example of tyndall's style will show how skilfully and cogently he forced the great authorities of his day to bear witness to the truth of his leading proposition the natural antiquity of all the reasonable precepts of the bible the most accurate dr barrow gives this character of the christian religion that its precepts are no other than such as physicians prescribe for the health of our bodies as politicians would allow to be needful for the peace of the state as epicurean philosophers recommend for the tranquillity of our minds and pleasures of our lives such as reason dictates and daily shows conducive to our welfare in all respects which consequently were there no law enacting them we should in wisdom choose to observe and voluntarily impose them on ourselves confessing them to be fit matters of law and most advantageous and requisite to the good general and particular of mankind that great and good man dr tillotson says that all the precepts of christianity are reasonable and wise requiring such duties as are suitable to the light of nature and do approve themselves to the best reason of mankind such as have their foundation in the nature of god and are an imitation of the divine excellencies such as tend to the perfection of human nature and to raise the minds of men to the highest pitch of goodness and virtue they command nothing that is unnecessary they omit nothing that may tend to the glory of god or the welfare of men nor do they restrain us in anything but what is contrary to the regular inclinations of nature or to our reason and true interest they forbid us nothing but what is base and unworthy to serve our humours and passions to make ourselves fools and beasts in a word nothing but what tends to our private harm or prejudice or to public disorder and confusion the late dean of canterbury in a sermon preached in defence of christianity says what can be a more powerful incentive to obedience than for a rational creature clearly to discern the equity the necessity the benefit the decency and beauty of every action he is called to do and thence to be duly sensible how gracious a master he serves 
one that is so far from loading him with fruitless arbitrary and tyrannical impositions that each command abstracted from his command who issues it is able to recommend itself and nothing required but what every wise man would choose of his own accord and cannot without being his own enemy wish to be exempted from and this character of christianity he makes to be essential to its being from god and therefore must make it the same with natural religion which has this character impressed on it there was none of the doctrines of our saviour says the late archbishop of york calculated for the gratification of men's idle curiosities the busying and amusing them with airy and useless speculations much less were they intended for an exercise of our credulity or a trial how far we could bring our reason to submit to our faith but as on the one hand they were plain and simple and such as by their agreeableness to the rational faculties of mankind did highly recommend themselves to our belief and so on the other hand they had an immediate relation to practice and were the general principles and foundation on which all human and divine virtues were naturally to be superstructed sermon before the queen on christmas day seventeen twenty four does not every one see that if the religion of nature had been put instead of christianity these descriptions would have exactly agreed with it the judicious dr scott affirms god never imposes laws on us pro imperio as arbitrary tests and trials of our obedience the great design of them says he is to do us good and direct our actions to our own interest this if we firmly believe will infinitely encourage our obedience for when i am sure god commands me nothing but what my own health ease and happiness requires and that every law of his is both a necessary and sovereign prescription against the diseases of my nature he could not prescribe less than he has without being defective in his care of my recovery and happiness with what prudence and modesty can i grudge to obey him nay the most considerate men even among the papists do not scruple to maintain there's nothing in religion but what is moral the divines of port royal for instance say all the precepts and all the mysteries that are expressed in so many different ways in the holy volumes do all centre in this one commandment of loving god with all our heart and in loving our neighbors as ourselves for the scripture it is saint austin who says it forbids but one only thing which is concupiscence or the love of the creature as it commands but one only thing which is charity and the love of god upon this double precept is founded the whole system of the christian religion and it is unto this say they according to the expression of jesus christ that all the ancient law and the prophets have reference and we may add also all the mysteries and all the precepts of the new law for love says st paul is the fulfilling of the law and these divines likewise cite a remarkable passage of st austin on this subject viz he that knows how to love god and to regulate his life by that love knows all that the scripture propounds to be known and might add the authority of a greater man and a papist too who says religion adds nothing to natural probity but the consolation of doing that for love and obedience to our heavenly father which reason itself requires us do in favour of virtue archbishop of cambray letters sur la religion page two fifty eight paris tyndall was a solid rather than a brilliant writer but he perfectly knew what he was about and the work from which we quote was well conceived and carefully executed 
his ground was skilfully chosen his arguments were placed on an eminence where his friends could see them and where his enemies could not assail them dr leland in his view of deistical writers is quite in a rage with him because he discredits book revelation to set up nature's revelation his real offence was that he did prove that nature was the only source of truth and reason the criterion by which even divine revelation must be judged he carried men back to the gospel of nature by the side of which the gospel of the jewish fishermen did not show to advantage tyndall did put something in the place of that which he was supposed desirous of removing how unwilling christians of that day were to admit of improvement in religion is shown by the number of attacks tyndall's works sustained the bishop of london published a second pastoral letter against it dr thomas burnett confuted it mr law fully answered it dr stebbing obviated the principal objections in it the same learned and judicious writer observes leland a second time entered the lists in answer to the fourteenth chapter of a book entitled christianity as old as the creation mr balgny issued a second letter to a deist occasioned by tyndall's work mr anthony o'key gave a short view of the whole controversy dr forreter dr john conybeare particularly engaged public attention as dr tyndall's antagonists mr simon brown produced a solid and excellent answer and dr leland with many blushes tells us that he himself issued in dublin in seventeen seventy three two volumes taking a wider compass than the other answers christianity as old as the creation is a work which freethinkers may yet consult with advantage as a repertory of authorities no longer accessible to the readers of this generation what these authorities allege will be found to have intrinsic value to be indeed lasting testimonies in favor of rationalism in passing in review the noble truths tyndall insists that it is impossible not to wonder at the policy or rather want of policy displayed by christians tyndall is an author whom they might be proud of if they were really in love with reason Tyndall's opponents have shown how instinctively the children of faith distrust the truths of nature. After all the refutations and confutations and answers made to the great deist, Tyndall's work has maintained its ground, and the truths he so ably and spiritedly vindicated have spread wider since, and taken deeper root. End chapter 16 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina.